what would you have told your younger self to do more of or less of? I didn't know the phrase at the time, but uh, to have less imposter syndrome and a little bit okay with your ignorance and the fact that you've not done any of this before or anything remotely like it, that you will figure things out. You know, kind of working through that first startup, I made what I later thought were like unnecessary mistakes uh, or things that, oh, I could have done this faster. And it turns out a lot of those lessons are kind of trials by fire that sometimes you have to kind of walk through the valley of fire and learn those things that actually builds good discipline. And I didn't realize that until after I did my second one, which is, oh, I'm going to do all the things right this time. And as it turns out, not everything that I did in that first one was wrong or stupid. What kind of things would you give as entrepreneurial lessons that stemmed from that experience? Yeah, uh, a couple. One is around just the uh, goodness that comes with uh, frugality is not the right word, but scrappiness, right? So at the time, you know, we started the company with a, and it literally was ten thousand dollars, you know, all on credit cards. Uh, and you know, this is Birmingham, Alabama, so there is no venture capital. There are no angel investors. Instead of throwing money at problems because you don't have money to throw at problems, you sort of throw creativity at them. Like, what can we do to kind of work through this particular limitation? I think that's a valuable lesson. So HubSpot's sort of like a merger of the two. It's like, okay, let's go back to some of the original basics. It was built in a much more scrappy, uh, resourceful way. So that's kind of lesson number one. Lesson number two, if you happen to be kind of building in the shadow of either a really large partner, which we happen to have in that first company, um, you have to be careful because then there's an inherent ceiling to what you're going to be able to accomplish if your destiny is overly controlled uh, by either a platform provider or a strategic partner, someone that uh, you know wields a lot of influence. Those can be you know great in the early days, and they were for us, but you always kind of go through this... Uh, kind of love-hate relationship with that partner. It's like, oh, we love you because you're innovating, you're building on our platform, that's awesome. Oh, we hate you because we should be building these things and you're taking up increasing percentage of the revenue that the customer is generating. And so those are lessons that I've carried with me is that partnerships are good, but they're not a silver bullet and they don't last forever in the way that a lot of people uh, might expect. How did the concept for HubSpot come about? What was that initial let's go moment? Yeah, my co-founder, Brian Halligan, and I met um, when we were both grad students at, at MIT in the Sloan School. Honestly, I was not supposed to do another startup uh, because I had been doing startups my entire professional career. I had promised my wife, who I met before my first startup, once, like, I'm done, like, I'm going to hang up the hat, and that's why I went to grad school. It's like, I'm going to go to grad school, maybe get a PhD, and then go teach. That was the original, original plan. But then I'm there in business school, and I, I guess I have that genetic flaw that uh, pretty much all entrepreneurs have, which is once you start one, it's sort of hard to stop. Amidst classes, we're like, okay, we had two kind of epiphanies. One was that marketing fundamentally was broken. And the way marketing had worked uh, for a long, long time was you had a marketing budget, however big or small, and then would use that budget to kind of blast the world with your message in the hopes that some small fraction of people that cared would buy whatever you had to sell. And so you would buy advertising, you'd go to trade shows, you'd buy email lists, you'd buy lists of phone numbers, you'd hire you know, a team of people to call them, all those things. And we call that outbound marketing, which is, okay, was great while it lasted, but as a society, we had become immune to those outbound marketing tactics. We had caller ID, we had spam protection, we had all these mechanisms where we essentially walked around with this bubble that protected us from marketing messages, right? Uh, and we've gotten really good at it. And even, this is 16 years ago. And the better way to do it is to take that same budget, however big or small, and use it to pull customers in by actually creating value for them. So create content, create videos, do something that adds value to their lives that then pulls them in. And then you can tell them, oh, here's how I can help. And here's the product that I have to offer. And we call that inbound marketing. Every time we talked about this, uh, both amongst ourselves and inside of our heads, it's like it made complete sense. So we had this realization. My co-founder, his first job out of the Sloan School was to go work for a venture capital firm as a venture partner. And the idea there was he's scoping out possible startups to join and, and kind of get a lay of the land. So he had a bunch of portfolio companies that he was helping with their go to market. Like, how do you get customers? Uh, at the same time that he was doing that, I had started a blog called OnStartups.com. Um, and that was part of my graduate thesis that I was writing. The kind of the realization we came to is like, oh, the blog that I was doing that I had no funding, no people working on other than me was getting 10 times more traffic, more interest, more everything than his venture backed people with VPs of marketing and like folks that were doing marketing for a living. And that's when we put kind of two and two together. It's like, oh, there's a better way to market. And right now, the reason most businesses are not doing it this better way is because if you're an enterprise, fine, you could do those things and leverage the Internet and do it this new way. But if you were a small or medium-sized business, uh, that was just inaccessible to you. So we made the decision that we wanted to help these businesses kind of get off the sidelines and into the game and kind of transform how they reached customers.